In this lesson, we will discuss ideals of a ring. So just as normal subgroups allowed us to construct factor groups, we'll see that special subrings called ideals play a similar role in ring theory. So let's begin with the definition of an ideal. A subring I of a ring R is called an ideal and sometimes for emphasis it's called a two-sided ideal if for every element R in the ring R and for every element A in the ideal I both elements RA and AR are in I. So we think of an ideal as a subset of a subring of R that absorbs multiplication by an arbitrary element of R. So if you multiply R times A or A times R, you still have an element of I. So equivalently, we can write this as R times I is contained in I and I times R is contained in I, again, for any arbitrary element R in the ring. So we see that I absorbs elements of R. So an ideal I, we say absorbs elements of R. So to show that a subset I of a ring R is an ideal, it's necessary to show that it's a subring and then also that it is closed under multiplication by all elements of R, not just closed under elements of, of I. So for our ideal test, a subset I of a ring R is an ideal if we want to check three conditions. One, I is non-empty, just like when we were checking that a set was a subring, we checked that the subset is non-empty. Two, we checked that it's closed under subtraction, so A minus B is an I for all A, B, and I. And then if we we're showing that this subset is a subring, we would show that it's closed under multiplication as well. But to show that it is an ideal of R, we're going to show that it's closed under arbitrary multiplication by elements of the ring R. So RA and AR are elements of I for all A and I and for all R in the ring. So again, this, we summarize this by saying that the ideal absorbs elements of the ring. Now a few notes about ideals. So let R be a ring. If 
then the first note, R is an ideal of itself. So R is an ideal and the, the set contain only the element zero, the additive identity, this is also an ideal. Secondly, we say an ideal I is, is called proper if I is any ideal other than the ring R itself. So if I does not equal R. Now the ideal containing only element zero is called the trivial ideal. And is often just denoted by zero. So let's look at an example of an ideal. Let's look in the ring of integers. For any integer n, the set n z containing all the multiples of n is an ideal of the integers. So let's show the three cases. Well, clearly, nz is not empty because nz contains the integer 0, plus or minus n, plus or minus 2n, and so on. So this set is not empty. Now let's show that nz is close under subtraction. So if I take two elements of NZ, let's call them NA and B, be elements of NZ, so A and B are therefore integers. Then NA minus NB equals N times A minus B. And since A and B are both integers, A minus B is an integer and therefore this is an element of nz. Now let m be any integer, an arbitrary integer, and let's take an element of nz, so let, let na be an element of nz. We need to show that the product of m and na is an element of nz. So then m times n a, since this is commutative, this should equals n times m a, and m and a are both integers, so m a is an integer, and therefore n times m a is an element of n z. Now, in a non-commutative ring, we would have to check that both left and right multiplication is closed um, by arbitrary elements of the ring. But since the integers are commutative, we only need to check that m times na is an element of nz. And so these are the three requirements to show that nz is an ideal. It's not empty, closed under subtraction, and closed under arbitrary multiplication by elements of the ring z. So we're going to look at some more examples of ideals. Now let R be the ring which consists of consists of functions. So this is the ring of all functions from the closed interval. from 
0 to 1 to the real numbers. And we're going to define the following set i. equal to the set of all functions in R such that f of q equals zero where q is a rational number. So these are the all the functions that are defined on the closed interval from zero to one to a real number such that f of q is zero. So whenever the input is a rational number, the output is zero. So we'll show that, uh, that i actually is an ideal. So let's show this. First, we're going to show that i is non-empty. Well, the function that's zero on the whole closed interval from zero to one, the function that's identically equal to zero is in the set i, so i is non-empty. So the function f from zero, one to r defined by f of x equals zero. This function is in i. And thus, i is not empty. Secondly, let's look at subtraction. So let f and g be functions in i, and let q be a rational number. In the closed interval from zero to one, then f minus g of q is defined as f of q minus g of q, and since both of these functions are in i, f of q equals zero and g of q equals zero. So this is zero minus zero, which equals zero. So thus, f minus g is an i. See that i is closed under subtraction. And finally, let's let f be an i let g be an arbitrary function in the ring R. And again, let q be a rational number in the interval from zero to one. And f times g of q is defined as f of q times g of q but f of q is zero, so this is zero times g of q, which equals zero. Thus f times g is in i. And since this ring is commutative, we don't need to check that g times f is also in i. But this is all that we need to, to show that i is an ideal of r. So now we're going to look at three more examples of ideals, but we're gonna start by assuming that we have two ideals, i and j, of a ring r. So we're going to look at ways to create a new ideal from the ideals i and j. So let's call these three examples, let's just call them facts. So fact one, we're going to show that i 
intersect J is an ideal of R. So again, our three steps, we know that as a subring, zero must be an I, so zero is an I, zero is in J, that zero is in I intersect J, and that shows that I intersect J is not empty. Now we need to show that I intersect J is closed under subtraction. So let A and B be elements of I intersect J. Then A and B are elements of I and A and B are elements of J. And since these are ideals, since I and J are ideals, they're closed under subtraction. So A minus B is in an I. So since I and J are ideals, A minus B is in I, and A minus B is in J. Thus, A minus B is an element of I intersect J. So we've shown that I intersect J is closed under subtraction. Now we need to show that I intersect J absorbs multiplication by an arbitrary element of R. And we, we don't know if this ring is commutative, so we need to actually show both cases of left and right multiplication. So let A be an I intersect J and let R be an element of the ring R. Then we know that A is an element of I and since I is an ideal, we know that A R and RA are elements of I. And similarly, we know that AR and RA are elements of J. Thus, AR and RA are elements of I intersect J. So this shows that I intersect J is an ideal of R. Now, again, we're going to use the fact that I and J are ideals of a ring R, but let's begin with the definition before our next example. So we're going to define the set I plus J to be equal to the set containing elements of the form A plus B B such that A is in I and B is in J. Again, I and J are ideals. Then our second fact I plus J is actually an ideal of R, but in but further, I plus J is the smallest. Ideal containing both I and J. So to show this, we're going to per first show that I plus J is an ideal, and then we're going to show that if if any other ideal contains I and J, then it will also contain the ideal I plus J. So first, we'll show that I plus J is an ideal. Oh, 
of R. So the same three steps. Since zero is in I and zero is in J, we have zero, which can be written as zero plus zero is an element of I plus J. Thus, I plus J is not empty. Now let's show that I plus J is closed under subtraction. So I'm going to let A1 plus B1, A2 plus B2 be arbitrary elements of I plus J. A1 plus B1 minus A2 plus B2 can be rewritten as A1 minus A2 plus B1 minus B2. And this is an element of I plus J since I and J are both closed under subtraction. Thirdly, we need to show that I plus J absorbs multiplication by an arbitrary element of the ring, R. So let A plus B be an element of I plus J. And let little r be an element of the ring, R. Then R times A plus B equals R A plus R B. This has to be an element of I plus J since I and J are ideals. And likewise, A plus B times R equals A R plus B R, which again is an element of I plus J. Since I and J are ideals, and therefore they both absorb R. So we've shown that I plus J is an ideal. So we've shown that I plus J is an ideal of R. And to see that it contains I, note that I is contained in I plus J. Since for every A and I, I can write A as A plus zero, which is an element of I plus J. And likewise, J is contained in I plus J. So I could write an arbitrary element of J as zero plus B. So we see that I plus J is an ideal and it's an ideal containing both I and J. Now to show that I plus J is the smallest ideal containing both I and J, we're going to assume that K is another ideal of R. So now suppose K is another ideal of R. Containing I and J. And we're going to show that K also contains I plus J. So therefore, I plus J is the smallest ideal containing both I and J. So 
we will show that k also contains i plus j. So let a plus b be an arbitrary element of i plus k. Then a is an i, b is an j, and hence a and b are both elements of k since we're assuming that k contains i and contains j. But if a and b are both in k, then a plus b is in k since k is an ideal and is closed under, under addition. So those a plus b is contained in k since k is closed under addition. Therefore, we can conclude that i plus j is contained in k. So if there's any other ideal that contains i and j, it'll also contain the ideal i plus j, and that establishes what we wanted to prove, that i plus j is the smallest ideal of R that contains both i and j. So we're going to look at another way to combine ideals i and j, but first we need another definition. So if i and j are ideals, let's define the set i times j. So this is going to be the set of all finite sums of elements of the form a b with a and i and b and j. So the product i j contains elements that look like this, a1, b1, plus a2, b2, all the way to a n, b n, such that all the a i are in the ideal i, all the b i are in the ideal j, and n is some natural number. So we have some finite sum of elements of the form a, b, where a is an i and b is a j. So it turns out that this product i, j is also an ideal of r. Further, it's an ideal contained in i intersect j. So that's our third fact. i, j is an ideal of R and further it's an ideal contained in I intersect J. So we've already shown that I intersect J is an ideal. So let's show that I J first is an ideal of R. So first let's show that I J is not empty. Well zero can be written as zero times zero and zero is an element of both i and j. So this is an element of the product i times j. So i times j is non-empty. Next we need to show that i, j is closed under subtraction. So let alpha, beta, be elements of ij with 
alpha equal to a finite sum of these elements a i b i and beta is also a finite sum of elements c i times d i where all the a i's and c i's are in i and all the b i d i are elements of J. So then the element A alpha minus beta which equals sum of the AI PI minus sum of the CI DI well, if I just absorb all of the minus signs in with the element ci, I can rewrite this as the sum of the ai bi plus the sum of negative ci times di. And again, since i is an ideal, negative ci are all in elements of, of i. So we have a finite sum plus another finite sum. So we have a total of a finite sum of elements where the first factor is an i and the second factor is in j. So thus this has to be an element of i, j. So we see that i, j is closed under subtraction. Thirdly, let's show that it's closed under arbitrary multiplication by an element of the ring. So let r be an element of the ring r. Well, since i is an ideal of R. We know that R alpha, which I can write as the sum of elements R A I times B I, this has to be an element of I J, since all of the elements are R A I, these are all elements of I. Similarly, since J is an ideal, it absorbs multiplication on the right by an arbitrary element R. And so therefore alpha R, which equals sigma AI BI R. Now all these elements BI R are in J because J is an ideal. So AI times BIR, the sum of these elements is in IJ. This IJ is an ideal of R. Now let's show that IJ is in the ideal I intersect J. Now, let alpha be an arbitrary element of ij. So it's going to look like the sum of ai bi Now, since each one of the ai's are in the ideal i, and i is an ideal, of R, we know that AI BI is an element of I for all I. Because the BI are still elements of the ring R and therefore AI BI is an element of I for, for each I. So then the sum of all these terms is also an element of I. So thus alpha must be an element of i. But likewise, we see that alpha must be an element of j. Because all the bi's are in j, 
and so therefore ai times bi is an element of j and then the sum of all the ai bi must be in j as well so we see that ij is contained in i and contained in j thus ij is contained in i intersect j so these three facts just give us ways to create a new ideal given two ideals i and j